presentation is a contribution from Virginia Tech. And at the break, I heard some discussion that now Virginia Tech people coming to the club, we may have to change the name. So you may want to be thinking about, instead of Tri-State, a new creative name. This presentation is entitled Characterization of Alpha Aluminum Carbide and will be presented by Todd St. Clair. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning. Uh, my name is Todd St. Clair. I'm a PhD student working with uh, David Cox and Ken Oyama at uh, Virginia Tech, the Department of Chemical Engineering. And I'm going to be speaking today about some work I've been doing characterizing single crystal molycarbide, the 0001 phase. The transition metal carbides and nitrides are well known to possess catalytic properties that are similar to that of platinum and ruthenium. This was first demonstrated in 1973 by Levy and Boudard, who reported the selectivity of a tungsten carbide catalyst was comparable to that of platinum for the isomerization reaction of neopentane. This sparked a flurry of interest in the carbides and nitrides as possible inexpensive alternatives to the uh, more expensive noble metal catalysts widely used in industry. To date, there have been uh, a large number of studies, ultra-high vacuum studies, done on carbide and single crystal metals, um, principally moly and vanadium. Um, however, there have been very few studies done on uh, true single crystal transition metal carbides and nitrides. And so we hope to, once this material is fully characterized, to use it to explore some model heteroatom compound reactions, um, possibly um, hydrodesulfurization or HDS reactions. The objectives of today's study are twofold. To uh, study the surface preparation using um, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy and low energy electron diffraction. And to probe surface sites using uh, carbon monoxide as a probe molecule with the techniques of thermodesorption spectroscopy or TPD, if some of you are more familiar with that terminology, and ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy. A simple schematic of the ultra-high vacuum system that I use. It uh, consists of two interconnected stainless steel ultra-high vacuum chambers. Both are equipped with turbo molecular pumps as well as titanium uh, sublimation pumps and can be cooled cryogenically to remove condensable gases from the background. The chamber on the left we refer to as the analysis chamber and it contains a concentric hemispherical analyzer for analyzing the energy of electrons as well as an X-ray and ultraviolet photon source for XPS and UPS, respectively. The chamber on the right is the analysis chamber, and uh, it is equipped with a quadrupole mass spectrometer, um, lead reverse view optics, and IR transparent windows for reflection, absorption, infrared spectroscopy. The sample itself is mounted onto a tantalum sample holder. Um, this is accomplished via tantalum shims and stainless steel screws. There's a type K thermocouple cemented directly to the back of the single crystal through a hole in the sample holder, allowing direct measurement of the sample temperature. The um, thermocouple is interfaced with a temperature controller and a power supply to allow um, heating rates uh, to be accomplished for uh, thermal desorption experiments. Now I'd like to show um, a representative uh, XPS result for a sputtered molycarbide surface. Um, that's been annealed to 1,000 Kelvin. And uh, I'd just like to point out that for the carbon 1S spectrum, the peak is centered at 283.1 eV binding energy, which corresponds to a carbidic carbon. The graphitic carbon that we observe at uh, before sputtering and at lower annealing temperatures we're able to remove. Um, and secondly, I'd like to point out that for the molybdenum 3D peaks, centered at 228.1 eV for the 3D 5 halves peak, this corresponds to a molybdenum carbide as well. The only surface contamination that we've been able to detect is oxygen, and um, through any combination of sputtering and annealing, we're not able to remove that. However, it is less than two, per two atomic percent, so it's very small. We've studied the effect of the annealing temperature on the surface molly to carbon ratio as calculated from XPS. 
data. And you see that between temperatures of 800 and 1300 Kelvin, we get a relatively consistent value, surface uh, moly to carbon ratio, between 2.5 and about 2.8. Um, however, above 1300 Kelvin, you see this drops off drastically. As indicated by the red line, at 1050 Kelvin or higher for annealing temperatures, we detect iron contamination, excuse me, iron contamination on the surface. Um, we have since um, found out that this is coming from sublimation of our stainless steel set screws. And um, so this limits us in our surface preparation to temperatures below 1050 Kelvin for annealing. Um, the drop off seen above 1300 Kelvin, we are going to have to explore once we have modified our sample mounting procedure because we are not sure whether this is a true phenomenon or whether it's related to the fact that we get a large amount of iron deposited once we get to those high temperatures. So um, for this study today, we're confined then to, to annealing temperatures of 1,000 Kelvin or lower. 1,000 Kelvin is what we've used as a standard surface preparation. Um, these are a couple of lead results, and I'd just like to show that this is on a sputtered surface annealed to 1,000 Kelvin, and you see a consistent one-by-one one lead periodicity. However, annealing the same surface 50 Kelvin higher, which is where we begin to detect the iron contamination, we see a faint root 3 by root 3 rotated 30 degrees adsorbate structure. And again, this may or may not be due to the iron contamination. Uh, once we have the new um, sample mounting procedure implemented, we'll be able to further investigate that. So moving on to the second part of our study concerns the adsorption of CO on the single crystal surface. And uh, CO is typically dissociative on metals, but not on the corresponding metal carbides. And uh, so we plan on investigating that as well as using uh, TDS and UPS to gain some insight into exactly how CO is bonded to the surface. Just as a quick, quick background on uh, CO work that's been done previously on uh, Molly single crystals. There are two known types of CO that desorb um, from a Molly single crystal. These are denoted alpha and beta. CO alpha is a molecularly adsorbed CO that comes off at a lower temperature, a relatively lower te temperature compared to the beta CO. And uh, the beta CO is a dissociatively adsorbed CO that comes off at higher temperatures. However, the interesting thing is that uh, following the work of Maddox and Co. on Molly 100 or Iwasawa et al. on 110, they found that on a carbided Molly single crystal phase, they only obtained molecular CO desorption from the surface. And this is illustrated with this diagram where we are looking at a side view of a Molly 100. This is a body center cubic uh, material. This is the first molyatomic layer. This is the second molyatomic layer. This represents a molecularly adsorbed CO molecule. The um, grayish tint is the carbon, blue is oxygen. And this represents a dissociatively adsorbed CO molecule. Again, this represents carbon, this represents oxygen. And what Maddox and Co., among others, found was that they would only begin populating this molecularly adsorbed CO once all of these sites have been filled with dissociated CO. Now these correspond to fourfold hollow sites, and so only until they had saturated the fourfold hollow sites with dissociated CO did they begin to see the population of this molecularly adsorbed CO. However, if they then take a clean molly surface and carburize it by cracking ethylene at 500 Kelvin, I'm sorry, 500 Celsius, they obtain carbide atoms which they propose to be in these same fourfold hollow sites. So this black is a carbon atom in the form of carbide on the surface. And what they obtain then is once the surface is saturated with carbide atoms, they only get molecular CO off the surface. And so this serves as a possible differentiating factor between parent metals and single crystal, uh, uh, parent metals and uh, transition metal carbides. And finally, um, a last case that I want to discuss is uh, recent results by McGreen et al. on a monocarbide foil where unfortunately they saw the opposite. They saw uh, alpha and beta CO absorption from a monocarbide foil. Um, however, the, the sample itself is not as well defined as the single crystals used by Maddox and Co. And um, there's a possibility that graphitic contamination as well as the sputtering that they used on their surface may have caused uh, 
metal to be produced, uh, resulting in some beta CO. So it's uh, not as certain as to whether or not that CO beta is uh, uh, definitely coming from a dissociated adsorption. So for our thermal desorption studies, uh, obviously one thing we were looking for was to see if we saw any uh, molecular versus dissociated CO. And um, this is uh, the thermal desorption results uh, following adsorption at 110 Kelvin across a low dose range. For all of our thermal desorption experiments, the background pressure before dosing was less than 1 times 10 to the minus 10 millibar. We were cooling the chambers cryogenically. And um, a heating rate of 2 Kelvin per second was used for all experiments. This covers a range of 1 32nd of a Langmuir to 5 eighths of a Langmuir, where Langmuir is a measure of exposure, which is equivalent to 1 times 10 to the minus 6 torr times seconds. And you see that as we get to the higher and higher um, doses, we begin populating a total of five states. Two, two states above room temperature and two states that come off below room temperature. For the two states above room temperature, you see that there's a shift to lower peak temperatures with increasing coverage. And in particular, if you look at this highest temperature state, um, this behavior of the shift in peak temperature is characteristic of a second order desorption. However, if you look at the peak shapes, you see that these, these peaks, this high temperature peak, um, is asymmetric, and of course this is characteristic of a first order desorption. So there appears to be a uh, contradiction in the observations, and I'll come back to that in a minute. As we move to high dose range, again at 110 Kelvin, you see that the lower temperature states begin to become the most highly populated, and the high temperature states now are at a constant peak temperature, they're going to shift with increasing coverage. Um, and, and one of the lower temperature states goes from 150 Kelvin at 5 eighths of a Langmuir down to 133 Kelvin at 5 Langmuirs. So since we had populated two states that were desorbing at or above room temperature, we decided to do some room temperature CO adsorption to see what we would get. And we found that we populated one state. And again, we see a shift in peak temperature from 515 Kelvin at 1 20th of a Langmuir to 450 Kelvin at one Langmuir. And so again, we see the shift in peak temperature, which is characteristic of second order, but the peaks appear very asymmetric, which is characteristic of first order. If we plot area under the curve, area under the thermal desorption curve versus the dose, we can get a qualitative idea of how close we are to saturation. You see for the adsorption at 110 Kelvin, which is populating five states, at a dose of 10 Langmuirs, we are, the curve is bending over, indicating that we are approaching or very near to saturation. However, if you look at the adsorption at 300 Kelvin, even at a dose of one Langmuir, we've already saturated the one state that we can access at that temperature. So if we expand the scale and look across the low dose range and examine the slope of this line, the slope of this line is proportional to the sticking coefficient which is the ratio of the rate of adsorption over the total rate of collisions with the surface. And this sticking coefficient for the adsorption at 110 Kelvin, you can see, is very linear, indicating a constant sticking coefficient across this dose range, which indicates precursor-mediated adsorption. Now, if you look at, for the, uh, look at the adsorption at 300 Kelvin, um, we believe there are two regimes. The first one across these three points, which has a slope approximated by this very shaky hand, and uh, the second slope across this last three data points, a very low slope indicating, of course, saturation. And uh, so we believe that even in the case of the 300 Kelvin data, we have precursor-mediated adsorption, although since it's populated in one state, it's across a much smaller dose. So we decided to do a second-order redhead analysis on the room temperature CO data. And of course, if you get a linear fit to your data, you should have a second-order process. And we believe that's a pretty linear fit. Um, the slope of this corresponds to an activation energy of 74 kilojoules per mole, which is um, close to the value that we expect for a chemical absorption. It's, it's about 18 kilocalories per mole. And um, by estimating the sticking coefficient, taking an upper and lower uh, limit on the sticking coefficient, I'm able to calculate a pre-exponential, or at least a range for the pre-exponential, that varies between five and 5.4 times 10 to the minus seven centimeters squared per second, which is reasonable value for a second order process. Now that we've established that we have second order desorption, the next step was to look at some UPS. 
And just as a refresher for everyone, this is um, an illustration of the electron densities in the molecular orbitals of CO. The five sigma is the highest occupied molecular orbital. The two pi is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Um, the one pi and the four sigma are the next lowest um, molecular orbitals underneath the five sigma. And the five sigma is typically thought of as a non-bonding orbital because the electron density is centered so much around the carbon. So that in mind, we did UPS experiment on a clean surface, as indicated by the red data. And then we took a UPS spectrum of a dose surface that had one nanometer of CO on it and took a different spectrum. And you see that we see two peaks out of the background. These two peaks, this model, looks very much like a classic example of CO chemisorption on metals. The interpretation is as follows. The splitting between this peak and this peak is equivalent to the splitting in a gas phase UPS spectrum of CO. This indicates that we have gas phase CO on the surface, molecularly adsorbed CO on the surface. The fact that we do not see a five sigma peak in this region is typically interpreted as being um, an overlapping peak with the one pi. This is a result of a destabilization, or I'm sorry, a stabilization in the five sigma energy because the carbon is participating in a bond with the surface. The conclusion then is that carbon is bonded in down to the surface, as you would expect for CO chem resorption on metals. The other piece of information that we can glean from this data is the change in work function upon adsorption of the carbon monoxide. You see that the work function increases by 0.27 eV. This indicates that there's charge transfer from the metal to the CO. And this charge transfer is to the LUMOS, the 2 pi. Um, and this allows pi back bonding of the CO. This strengthens the metal carbon bond and weakens the carbon oxygen bond. This is uh, a good example of the basic Blauholder model that he proposed in uh, 67, I believe. So hopefully everyone can see the problem we have. Second order kinetics for molecularly adsorbed CO, when uh, intuitively you would expect for a molecularly adsorbed CO to have first order kinetics. People generally attribute apparent second order kinetics to one of two cases, and that is either first order desorption through a precursor state or first order desorption with coverage dependent activation energy. We decided to model these two cases, and we did this using a Polanyi Wagner rate expression. N of I is the concentration of species I on the surface, nu is the free exponential factor, and theta is the coverage. And for the first case of coverage dependent activation energy, we simply plugged in an equation to model the coverage dependency of the activation energy, and then used that equation to model thermal desorption. These are the results. Of course, I was able to pick an equation that would um, allow a, a peak temperature shift across the entire experimental data range that we saw for the 300 Kelvin adsorption. Um, you'll notice that the peaks are not a typical first order desorption asymmetric, so the peak shape has been altered. And um, when you do a corresponding second order redhead analysis on this data, you don't get a linear fit. And uh, so this indicates that if we have a coverage dependent activation energy case for the desorption of room temperature CO, that we would not get apparent second order kinetics. So we don't believe this is an explanation for um, what we have observed. The second possibility that I mentioned is desorption through a precursor state or intermediate state. This case has some appeal to us because this type of behavior was observed by King and co-workers in the mid-70s for molecularly adsorbed CO on platinum. And uh, so in lieu of the fact that the carbon and nitrides are known to possess catalytic properties similar to platinum, this is uh, an appealing idea if we can if we're able to formulate it to match our experimental results. Modified Polanyi Wagner rate form we use to model the intermediate state. The modification is in this factor F. F represents the portion of desorbing species in the precursor state that actually make it off the surface, that actually desorb from the precursor state. If F is one, then that means any species that gets into a precursor state desorbs, and you know you just see regular first order desorption kinetics. So F itself has dependencies on a number of factors, which include the probability that once a desorbing species has gotten into a precursor state, that it will reabsorb, that it will desorb, or that it will migrate to another precursor state, as well as the probability that once it gets into a precursor state over an occupied site, that it will either desorb or migrate, because it can reabsorb over an occupied site. 
And uh, F also has some theta dependency built into it. So the model results, unfortunately, I was not able to come up with a model that predicted a temperature shift large enough to um, match the experimental results. Uh, the temperature shift that I did model was 15 Kelvin. The experimental shift that I observed was 65 Kelvin, so not very close. Um, the uh, data reported by King et al. on Platinum 111, they were able to model a large temperature shift, much larger than what we were able to get. And we are currently in the process of contacting them and trying to reformulate our model so that we can predict a large temperature shift. Um, if you see the corresponding second order analysis, um, it is not linear. However, it's less nonlinear than the coverage dependent case, which uh, indicates that perhaps we're on the right road to explaining this, but for now, we've not conclusively shown that it is indeed uh, limited by desorption through a precursor state. To start wrapping up the results, this is a comparison of uh, CO alpha phase, or I'm sorry, uh, the CO alpha molecularly adsorbed desorption from a number of different systems. From two different Molly single crystal systems, you see the desorption temperature between 305 and 350 Kelvin while across three different carbide systems, whether that be a carbon overlayer, a monocarbide foil, or the current study using a single crystal monocarbide, we get a consistent desorption temperature between 325 and 330 Kelvin. Finally, for the, the last one that I've included is the platinum 111, which, um, as I mentioned before, has the identification of this apparent second order kinetics for CO desorption, while the temperatures don't necessarily match, what we are interested in is this uh, behavior and the possibility that we have desorption through a precursor state. Conclusions about our CO chemisorption. We have molecularly adsorbed CO at 300 Kelvin. We have a carbon <coughs> down pi back bonded molecular CO on the surface and the desorption appears second to work. We are able to consistently prepare a one by one alpha monocarbide surface by ion bombarding and following that with annealing to 1,000 Kelvin. And we observed molecular CO for adsorption at 300 Kelvin with apparent second order desorption kinetics. Future work, once we have implemented the new sample mounting procedure, we'll go to elevated temperatures to see if this results in a more ordered surface with no contamination, um, as well as using uh, rares to further examine the bonding of CO to the surface and finally progressed to investigating the HDS of model sulfur compounds. Lastly, acknowledgments. We would like to acknowledge Atani and Ishizawa of the Institute for Inorganic Materials Research in Japan for the donation of the monocarbide single crystal, as well as DOE PETC for financial support. Thank you. Disproportionation of the CO. I do not believe that we are seeing that. Um, I believe that the desorption temperatures are low enough that this indicates that it's just molecularly adsorbed CO, as well as the UPS results, which do not show anything other than a classic example of molecular CO two desorption on the metal. And you look for CO two. Yes, we look for CO two and, and all the carbon oxygen products. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I didn't catch. Could you tell me what the structure of the molycarbide is? It's orthorhombic phase. And, okay. And where, what is the, is it planar, the carbon and moly are planar sheets? Um, that's right, that is right. It's a hexagonal surface and the carbon and moly are planar. Exponential that we assume um, 
is valid for a first order process when you do the modeling. The pre exponential that we calculated using the second order, which of course is a parent second order, um, was 10 to the minus 7 centimeters squared per second. But the um, validity of the, of the pre exponential as far as the modeling goes, of course there's temperature dependence of the pre exponential as well as the activation energy. However, um, in most cases with the modeling, people simply model the activation energy because it's going to have a larger influence on the overall rate. That, that is what we're trying to model, right? I mean, it, it's it's a simplified case. The more complicated case is to model the what you're talking about and include that temperature dependence in the pre-exponential. Do you think if you did that, you could get a linear number? Um, actually, that's a possibility. I haven't considered that. Um, I was hoping that the modeling would lump all of the effects into the activation energy, but um, that, that's a good point. That's something I'll look into. That is, that is a possibility. It's my pleasure to introduce the final talk of this morning's session, and that is Dr. George Cocatilo, who has come south to be with us today. Uh, he obtained his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Alberta and earned a PhD in physics from Temple and has spent most or much of his career, up some 34 years at Mobile. Uh, since his retirement in 1982, he has been involved with uh, research with several universities, including the University of, well, pronounce that right? University of British Columbia in Pennsylvania. Uh, he's had just a relaxing retirement, and I understand he's published over 70 publications since retirement.